Be Wealthy and Smart, Episode 60. into a world of wealth and financial freedom without budgets, boredom, or bosses on Be Wealthy and Smart. And now, here's your host, Linda P. Jones. Welcome to Be Wealthy and Smart. I'm Linda P. Jones, America's Wealth Mentor, empowering women and men worldwide to financial freedom. On today's show, I'm so excited to have another mindset specialist, expert, and believer with me on the show. This is Austin Netsley, who actually retired at age 27 and is going to share his secrets to financial freedom. So welcome, Austin. How are you? I am excellent, Linda. Thank you so much for having me. So excited to be here. Uh, I think we connected right from the start, so this is going to be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, well, we met a couple of months ago at the FinCon conference for financial podcasters, bloggers, etc., and a mutual friend introduced us and said, you guys both talk about mindset. And I'm like, what? Really? And so I was so excited to meet another kindred spirit. And you're also an investor, very successful investor. And I just, you know, love this. This is my favorite stuff to talk about, two of my most favorite topics. So I'm really excited to have you here today. Well, I, it's mine as well. And there surprisingly weren't many mindset people there. But a lot of people were there talking about coupons and different things that I, I necessarily don't uh, talk about with my audience. So to find somebody that was dedicated to investing in the mindset, I was like, yes, all right. So. Exactly. It seems like a lot of the financial conversation these days has gone toward coupons or frugality. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to get your opinion about that later. But Tell us, first of all, how you got where you are. Yeah, so first of all, going back all the way into college, I had one vision. I wanted to become CEO, so I went down the typical route. I went to college, I went into the corporate world, and I worked for a company that I absolutely loved, and I was living my dream life. But then a couple years in to that job, I started to read and I started to see that there were some other opportunities. I started to see that there were people that were living a life even better than what I had envisioned. So uh, long story short, I got into day trading pretty heavily. I started to invest in the stock market and I was failing a lot. I was making money, I was losing it, making money, losing it. And finally I stopped and I w got pretty serious about it. Read over a hundred books about money and wealth and the mindset and really took my craft to the next level, created my own algorithm, automated that. And then I continued on working for the corporate world while I built up my fund on the side. And that's my story in a nutshell. And then, like you said, at 27, I quote unquote retired to travel around the world and do what I do now. Wow, that is so cool. So when you started in this job and your your boss told you to go read three books on the beach, how did that change your life and how did that open the door to a wealthy mindset? Yeah, he didn't know it at the time, but those three books literally changed my life. And w those three books were actually fictional books. They were Stone Fox, which most people read when they're 10 years older or, or younger. Uh, another book was The Book Thief. Another book was... Um, the Art of Racing in the Rain, which was a story of a family from a dog's perspective. So these books had nothing to do with money. They had nothing to do with sales. They had nothing to do with business, but they had everything to do with all those things because it's all about people at the end of the day. And these books did teach me about people, but they taught me that reading wasn't necessarily a bad thing. So my entire life, it had been forced on me, right? And this was an opportunity for me to go read some books like I was on vacation on the beach while I was living in Florida and I was getting paid to do them. So it brought joy to me, uh, uh, at least in, in my mind, reading was now a joy. And what I did was I also learned and I, I learned the power of books. And then from there, I went and got my library card and I consumed every single book about investing in business and mindset and um, self-help book that I could find. And 
every single chapter, every single book that I read slowly started to change my mindset to what was really possible. And that was the first step. And then it started to build my confidence and give me the specific training that I needed. And then I started to implement these things that I learned. And within 12 months, my life had changed. Like literally my life had changed, but it took over a hundred books to really change my mindset because like I said, I only had a, I had a hardcore middle-class mindset. I had one vision. It was a vision that was going to have me maybe some ex external success, but not the complete level of wealth that I could find. And I talk about wealth holistically. So it's a lot, it's a lot about money, but it's also about more things than that. And uh, I wasn't going to find those things in the corporate world, unfortunately. Exactly. But, you know, we have a lot in common with the reading of the books. I was an avid reader from a really young age and always loved books. And I read a lot from the library, too. And the advantage of reading books in the library is there's some classics in there mm. that may not even be on the bookshelves anymore, but they are amazing books. And I learned at a, a young age also that millionaires were always working on their mind. They were feeding mm. their mind positive messages. They were always educating themselves. They were uh, really thinking differently, thinking big. You know, some of those books are like The Magic of Thinking Big. I don't know if you read like some of those about bigger thinking. Did some of those cross your path? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that was really a, a huge thing for me. So initially when I started investing, I was like, all right, how do I make money investing? And then I started to learn the magic of thinking big. And, and then my next question, which is actually the same question, but it's just phrased a little bit differently, is how do I create a million dollar business that's automated that makes me money from investments. So really it's, it's the same thing as how do I learn how to invest, but they're two totally different perspectives that one eventually got me to my dream life. The other got me a lot of stress and maybe some knowledge about investing, but it's just investing is, or the mindset piece is just so huge. And for my book, which we'll talk about at the end here, uh, I interviewed 75 successful entrepreneurs, and the number one thing that came up that their secret to success was the magic of thinking big. So it's just so, so powerful. And at first, at least for me, Linda, it was a little bit weird to read these books. I thought they were a little woo-woo or a little bit out there. <laughs> but then after I hear a hundred different millionaires say um, something about it or say how impactful thinking grow rich it was, then I started to read it again and again and again. I started to practice those things and I started to see the results finally because they don't happen instantaneously, but they do happen very quickly. So if you keep doing um, these practices of convincing your mind, of thinking big, the results show up really, really quickly. So I've seen it for myself. I've seen it from hundreds of other people I've talked to. It's everything. I love that. I can't wait to read your book. That sounds really, really good. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm excited to get it out there. It's, the work is done. Now it's just a matter of getting it out in everybody's hands. Wow. Well, it's one thing to think big, but it's another thing to master the art of investing, and it is an art. So how are you able to do that so quickly, and how are you able to write this algorithm? And maybe you could explain what an algorithm is in case people don't understand what that means. Yeah. So first of all, an algorithm is just a complex way of saying, uh, of, of having a way to find a solution. So it's really going through a, a, a process of if this happens, then do this. If this happens, then do this. So I have several different indicators. One indicator I created, a couple of other indicators are pretty common that say when this happens, I'm going to buy a stock. When this happens, I'm going to sell that stock. So there's just a number of different parameters that I have that I have taken all of the emotion, all of the decision making out of investing, and I've tested it over hundreds of stocks, over thousands of different trades, just because from my perspective, what you need to have in the investing world to succeed is an edge. And I trade like a casino. So a casino doesn't care about one hand. They don't care about one person. They don't even care about one day. They know that over the long period of time, they have an edge that they're going to bring in money. They're going to make a lot of money. So from an investing standpoint, that's what I tried to get to. So I created my own algorithm um, that has an edge that 
one day I may lose a lot of money. One day, I'm, the next day I may make a lot of money. But over time, I'm going to consistently grow my fund, at least per the numbers that I've seen, at least if I uh, keep my risk tolerance um, within intact there. But um, how I got there was really learning every single different perspective. And with investing, there's so many different ways that you can make money in the stock market, so many different ways. But the bad thing is, there's so many different ways that you can lose money as well. So what you have to do is find a strategy that really appeals to you and then kind of go down that path. And so one of my favorite books, Lynn, I don't know if you read it, was uh, the Market Wizard series from Jack Schwager. Yes. He he has interviewed so many of the best investors over the last several decades. I think his first book was in the 80s. But what I learned from that book was that it doesn't matter what your there, there, there's no one secret formula. There's no one secret thing that's going to make you a lot of money. All these different investors that he has interviewed have a different style, and it's a style that is resonates with them. That um, goes along with their strengths and their interests, and that's the way that you have to uh, really excel. And basically, I read a couple hundred books. I've learned about every single strategy that was under the sun and I found some different ones that appealed to me and I kind of combined them and that's how I created my algorithm. Wow so is this more of a day trading strategy or what's your average length of hold on on a stock? It is a swing trading algorithm so it's kind of in between uh, short term and long term so my average hold is about 2.2 days I hold anywhere from 15 minutes to 15 days and uh, the the longer the better Uh, but my average is about 2.2 days and I tell people some of my stats and they say, that doesn't sound very good because I only make money on one out of every three trades. So that means two out of three trades, I actually lose. But the thing is, my winning trade is much larger than my losing trade. So over the long period of time, of course, it keeps going up. And I'm not looking for any big home runs. I'm looking for 2% here, 4% here, 1% here. Uh, then I have a 1% loss. Then just slowly, it just slowly adds up because my average daily um, gain is very, very small. But the power of compound interest makes that very, very large over a, a year's period of time and keep going that for a few years. And all of a sudden, you have a large fund. So you're probably cutting your losses short and letting your winners run. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's uh, a key for just about anybody in investing. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So do you have plans to market this? Is this going to be a future business? Are you selling this to a hedge fund? I mean, this sounds like, you know, it could bring in a lot of capital and cash for you. What are what are your plans with it? Yeah, there's a lot to be figured out. So it's I had one goal and my one goal was freedom and that's financially and personally. Mm hmm. And that's where you that's where that you I'm are. getting to is is how do I get to the next level? So, so I achieved my first level financial goals. Now I'm on to the next one. And there's some different ways to achieve that. So do I sell it to a hedge fund, like you said, which, which is a good possibility? I don't know. Do I keep scaling it up and keep it as uh, cash flow for me? That's another great option. That's probably the smarter thing to do long term. But it's not really a big passion of mine, Like even though it's my it's a means to an end for me. Uh, So my passion is what I'm doing now with writing books and motivating people and training people about the mindset and different things in my courses. Um, So what I'm doing with it is just it's it's on autopilot, if you will. So I want to get three years worth of experience uh, or three years of results with it. And then I'll be able to do basically anything I want to. But for right now, it's only my money. I'm not marketing at all. Um, I may eventually do something with my algorithm where I sell that or protect it in some way. I don't know. So long story short, I don't know what I'm going to 50 options. So uh, it's exciting. Like as, as long as you create something that's good for you and uh, potentially successful elsewhere, then you have opportunities and that's all you can ask for. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure it's of tremendous value. So good luck with that. That's, that's mm. amazing. Thank you. So you also talk about how to get out of debt. What, what advice do you have for people who are struggling with debt, really don't know where to go? I mean, there's a lot of different reports about debt. You know, I did a show on debt yesterday, actually, that was quite good. I highly recommend it. But I talk about why I don't recommend the debt snowball. But I want to mm. hear your recommendation of how people can get out of debt. 
Yeah, I don't recommend that snowball either. It, uh, I'm a numbers guy, so if you if it doesn't make sense from a number standpoint, then it doesn't make sense for me personally. But uh, um, the the first thing that people need to do is make the decision and commit to it. So with any level of wealth, what you have to do is have a clear focus, have an intention and, and make that decision. And once you do, you set that intention to work. And what, what, what I'm trying to get to is there's so many different things going on. Wealth is a complex thing. So if you want to achieve something great, you have to take it one step at a time. So if you have massive debt, then don't worry how to create your own investing algorithm. Worry how to get out of debt and have that as your clear focus. Because once you do, then you can increase your level of risk. Then you can increase your, your tolerance to do other things. And you can have a lot more flexibility. Um, but another key point that I can say that I see so many people doing, Linda, is they keep getting into debt. So the second element is to stop getting into new debt, whether it be continue to rack up credit card bills or, or do something else. There are some different options out there for people to consolidate debt or um, potentially call their, uh, basically forego some debt. But it's all about seeing what your opportunities are. And for me, I had 80000 actually $81,000 worth of debt coming out of college. And I paid that off in under three uh, years by paying as much as I can. And I had a clear focus. Like that was my goal. It was stressful for me to have this great cloud over my head of debt. So I had this one goal and was, I was going to get out of debt. And that was my focus. And I put every single penny I could towards that. And uh, that's how I paid it off in, in under three years. But from a strategy standpoint, I like the debt stacking method because I pay the highest interest rate first, pay the minimums on everything else, and get rid of the loans as quick as possible. And by paying that highest interest rate loan first, I was able to reduce the amount of total interest that I paid. It means I was debt free much quicker. And uh, by well over twelve thousand dollars on my debts. Wow! Did you talk to the credit card companies at all and do any negotiating with them? I didn't have any credit card debt. It was one uh, car loan, and then the rest were federal aid student loans. And the federal aid student loans, unfortunately, are not as flexible. But if you do have credit card debt or some other uh, bad forms of debt, then those are much more flexible as far as what you can consolidate and what you cannot. Right. Wow, that's really interesting. Well, I agree with paying off the highest interest rate debt first, but I also prescribe that people pay the largest balances first because if you're maxed out, yours wasn't a, a credit card, but if you had a credit card and you're maxed out on your card, you actually mm. could start creating a better credit score by taking down the most maxed out balance first as well as the highest interest rate. So That's a great point. That's a great point. So how many credit cards do you think somebody should have? Well, let's ask you that question. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, I, what I've done because I, I learned early on that your credit score is affected by that. So if you have one credit card and you're racking it, say it's $10,000 is your credit limit, and you're racking up $8,000 on that, that's not nearly as good as having $4,000 on two $10,000 credit limit cards, right? Correct. So I ha actually have always had three credit cards or more, and I think it's great to have low balances on those high credit limit credit cards if people follow what I'm saying. <laughs> right, exactly, because the negative thing is having a maxed out balance. And if yes. you can get it down to 50%, that actually uh, is very, very healthy for your credit and improves your credit score dramatically. So you can actually improve your score while you're paying off debt, whereas the debt snowball paying off these low balance cards, these low balances first that aren't maxed out, you're not improving your, your credit score at all. So you're prolonging the time it takes to improve your credit score. So that's right, why right. I don't like that's that. A, that's, a, that's a great subtle hint. And the credit score matters. Like It really matters because it creates the payments that you'll have in the future. So if you're thinking about long-term wealth, which you should be, uh, you should think about all these important elements. So that's a, that's a great uh, point that I haven't heard, Linda. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And also it can help people do something like refinance their home, which mm. might, you know, they might be able to use equity to pay off their student loans, for example. And then that makes their payment, you know, the interest tax deductible on their mortgage. So it becomes now a tax deductible expense versus a non-tax deductible expense so 
Yeah. Completely agree. Completely agree. And, and from a refinancing perspective, if you have a 30 year mortgage and you change your interest rate by even 0.5%, we're talking about tens of thousands of dollars. Like it's a huge, huge number. So it's super, super important. And if you buy like a $200,000 home over the life of your mortgage, you're probably going to pay, uh, I think it's anything above 5% interest rate, anything above that, you're going to be paying more than double the amount of, of the value of the mortgage. So you're going to be paying over $400,000. So any chance that you can save 0.5%, 1% here and there, it really adds up to huge numbers. Absolutely. So that's a great point why a good credit score is very important. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So did you... Did, are, are you of the mindset of being a frugalist? And let me define, there's, there's being frugal, there's being careful, and then there's what I call a frugalist is like this extreme lifestyle that is sort of becoming popular now to, you know, live in a 200 square foot house in your backyard mm-hmm. and to go camping for entertainment and never to go eat in restaurants and to give up your car and ride a bike. I mean, there's this crazy frugalist movement going. So where do you stand in all this frugality that's going on today? Well, it's funny. I'm, I'm kind of all of the above, but I kind of hate all of the above as well. So let me explain. So not necessarily a frugal, frugalist in the way that you're talking about it, but what I am is very aware of what's going on with my finances. So I think I've never had a budget in my life. Like I hate budgets. I think budgets are kind of a, a sin word. It's it's boring. It makes finances have a bad taste in my mouth, if you will. So, um, but at the same time, I'm very aware of where my money's going, and by having that focus, I I can then kind of combine that with my priorities. So my priorities are to have freedom and travel and do all these different things that I want to do instead of spending it on things that I don't get any value out of. So when I asked the 75 successful entrepreneurs that I interviewed what true wealth is to them, uh, one word that often came up was experiences. So I personally spend a lot of my money on experiences and not necessarily on things. So I'm a minimalist as far as things, but I'm not necessarily, I would never cut coupons. I'll never look at the price of gas. Uh, Five cents on crossing the street is not going to save me anything worth my time to do that or to even worry about it. So uh, I, but I am frugal by nature as far as focusing on what really matters. So that's why I'm a a kind of a mix of all those things, but it it makes me sick if, if people are, penny wise and dollar stupid. So I'd much rather worry about how do I make a million dollars instead of how do I save five dollars? Wow, Austin, you and I are so similar. This is hilarious. I have a phrase, budgets can be hazardous to your wealth. (laughs) And I don't like budgets either. I cannot stand budgets. Um, But I do think, yeah, you need to be aware and have your priorities. I call that opportunity cost to understand Mm -hmm. what you want to do, what's important to you. And to focus on experiences, and I love all of that. That's right on target. It's perfect, and that's all part of the mindset, too. It is, yeah. What daily practices do you have that might help people? Do you have anything that you do that, you know, with this focus that you have on your finances, do you, um, you know, do anything in particular or keep any kind of calculation or have any spreadsheet, or how do you keep your focus? Uh, from a financial perspective, I don't do anything. And I, I think that's surprising to a lot of people, but I think it's powerful because people think, oh, I need to do this on a daily basis or I need to um, continue to learn about this for the rest of my life. Well, well, what I talk about is set something up, make things automatic so that you don't have to worry about it. Like even though money is like such a passionate subject for me, such I, I, I read books about like my whole library is full of money books and most people would fall asleep if they read these things but I love the subject of learning about it but I also love living my life and what I do is learn something and then automate it and then I don't have to worry about it again or at least I don't have to worry about it on a daily basis now monthly or quarterly I can check different things but as far as a habit 
Um, one thing that's not necessarily related directly to money, but one habit that I would say is I start out my day with 90 minutes of going after my biggest task. Like, what is the one thing that's going to make my life better this week? What's the one thing that's going to make my life better today? And I get that done in the first 90 minutes, and then I go have breakfast and start my day and do everything else. But that's not related directly to um, the question. But I think it's important. Automate whatever it is that you want so that you can go on living your life. So when you talk about automation, are you saying that all your bills automatically come out, your savings is automated? What things are you automating? Every single thing that can possibly happen. So I have money going straight from my check to my different accounts that I want it to. I have my different bills being pulled straight out of my checking account, and I have um a text every single morning of my trading performance from the previous day. So after I turn off my program, I don't even look at what happened. I just get a text the following morning and I don't care how much money I made. I just care about the percentage and I'm just continue following that every single day, making sure everything's okay. Um, so literally my money is all automated. Like I could go on doing whatever I'm doing now for months and months and months before anybody even realized I, I was gone. <laughs> 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 Which is a bad way to put it, but that's um, it, like I could go over in Asia and just continue to live my life. That's what I, where I was for a long time earlier this year. So it's uh, it allows me to do what I really want to do, and I think a lot of people uh, want to get to that state. So find out how to automate the things that are are causing you a lot of headache. You don't necessarily need a budget, but what you do need maybe are restrictions on certain areas, uh, maybe updates uh, from your credit card company. There's different ways that you can get all these things automated. Interesting. Do you have any websites that you like, or do any websites help you with that? Uh, the best website as far as understanding all these things and getting updates on, on your bills and where your money's going, from my experience, is Mint.com. And I suggest everybody to go sign up for that. Even if you think you're in a really good position with your finances, go and sign up for it. Because what it does is track all of your different accounts. And what I like to do every once in a while, every, every month or two, I'll go in and look at my different transactions. And a lot of times there'll be ones that are sticking out that I'm like, oh, what's this bank, what's this bank fee? Or what's this credit card charge? You'll find different things that are wrong and you can save, I don't know, a few thousand dollars a year potentially uh, by, by uh, that's probably a little high, maybe a couple hundred dollars a year by finding different recurring fees and different things that you didn't know about. But um, you also really get a clear vision of where things are going. And Mint.com does a great thing, great job of showing you some charts so you can see where your money's going and where it's trending over time. So it uh, really puts the different things into perspective so that you can't fix what you know, don't know, right? And Mint.com gives you the awareness to know where things are. So from there, the solutions become easy. So you use that regularly? Uh, I use it at least on a monthly basis, but not much more than that, yeah. Okay. And do you have any phone apps or anything that you use? No. I, I have some that I record expenses for my business, uh, Biz Expense Tracker, which is an app. Um, other than that, I don't think I have any. Um, use um, Capital One has some great credit cards. They have great, great, great customer service, which from a uh, uh credit card standpoint is my number two thing. Number one is rewards and they have some great rewards as well. So everything between those three uh, is really pretty easy to manage with your phone and online. And then the other piece is what you do with your investments. And 401k is easily set up uh, with your 401k provider. I recommend Vanguard. Uh, and then I also have money go to them directly for my IRA accounts as well. And then uh, for my broker, Interactive Brokers for any uh, active uh, traders is a great, great service. And it doesn't look pretty, but it's very, very functional. And they're the ones that give me my text message every day. Hmm. That's interesting. So you were able to actually have this system and travel around the world. What lessons did you learn from traveling? Oh, my gosh. Traveling is everything. Like You learn so much about yourself and other people by doing so. So I highly encourage anybody to travel. And I've always had the travel bug. And that was another reason why I wanted to create something that necessarily didn't need my time. But um, one of my favorite lessons is 
about money. So I've been to some of the richest countries. I've been to some of the poorest countries. And two of the countries I traveled to earlier this year in Southeast Asia were Cambodia and Laos. And these two countries, like the average family there makes about $2 per day. That is just over 700 and something dollars per year. It's unbelievable how little they make compared to people in the U.S. But you know what, Linda? They were the happiest people I've ever met. Like They were just so happy and so free. And the reason that they were so happy is because they under they understood what they really wanted. And I think this is what everybody in the world really wants. It doesn't matter where you are. And I think we want freedom. I think we want freedom to do whatever it is that we really want. I think we want the freedom to live our life and travel if we want to, or be able to not work when we don't want to work and work when we want to work and do things that we're passionate about. So it's all about that freedom. And the difference between people in the U.S., from my experience, or at least most people in the U.S., and people in Southeast Asia who necessarily didn't have as much money is that awareness of what we what it is that we really want. So I think there's a misnomer in the U.S. that we want money. Like money is the solution to everything. Money's not necessarily the solution to everything. It's a tool that can help make everything easier, but it's not the solution in and of itself. And people in Southeast Asia worked just enough to have the freedom that they wanted to, and then they went and did that. And they were very aware of that and just extremely happy, like I said. So that was a a big eye-opener that um, I already knew it because I already read a a lot and I had already traveled. But, man, $2 per day was just eye-opening to me. Like, that's nothing here in the U.S. And uh, they had everything they wanted. Yeah, it doesn't require a big house or a fancy car to be happy or to have a good life, right? Right, right. Well, I love the study. I think it was, oh, what book was it? I I don't know. But they did this study, and the average family needs to make at least $70,000. And anything above that doesn't have any real level of impact on a family's happiness. So you have to cover the needs, and seventy thousand dollars is even a lot. Like it gives you enough flexibility, but beyond that, it's all about um, finding per- personal happiness, and, and money doesn't have a, a huge, huge impact on anything above that. So it's it's an important tool, but it's not everything. Yeah. I agree. And I I liked what you said about financial freedom, financial independence. I think that's so important to so many people. And I think that we're in a new era of prosperity where we're going to be able to create more wealth because of the computer and Internet and things like what you've done with your algorithm and, you know, Internet businesses and marketing. And it's just amazing the opportunities that we have to not have to be in a job, to not have to go to corporate to be an entrepreneur and create a stream of income. Don't you agree? Well, I love your mentality because I hear so much negativity and I just have the opposite. I have the exact view that you have, that there's so much opportunity. Like every single day, there's so much more opportunity. Everybody thinks, oh, my idea was stolen or, oh, you know, that was already taken. But no, there's another problem, another challenge, another different way to solve it. Like there's so many people that we can access out there. And it's it's funny, Linda, after I started uh, my podcast, Yo Pro Wealth, within 60 days of starting it, and mind you, I was terrible. I'm not the best interviewer. I'm an introvert, um, naturally. And even though I was just interviewing people, I had six people email me and over listen, listeners in over 90 countries and six people email me that I was changing their life and I wasn't doing anything yet. But what that did, that's not a pat on my back. That's just to say how many people that you can actually access there, especially once you're living a life that's true to you, you can access so many people and the opportunity is just so, so amazing. So it's really, really exciting. And the people that are taking advantage of it are going to be wealthy beyond uh, anything they could ever imagine. That's right. And it really comes back to mindset because You know, if the mindset, the mindset that you had in the beginning was work in the corporate job, become a CEO, go as high as I can, you know, have the highest success that you can in in the most traditional way. And then you just flip that upside down and said, you know, I... I want financial freedom and I can figure out how to do this. And then you went and did it Mm -hmm. and you made that decision and you created the path to go and do that. Mm -hmm. And I think today that is really the mindset shift that so many people have to make is that it's not about finding the job or getting the paycheck. It's about using your skills and talents that will create wealth for you. And I just believe everyone has that potential if they focus in on it and really believe that they can do it. 
Exactly. You just have to take control of your future. And it doesn't matter what your education is. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't even matter how much success you've had in the past. All that matters is in the future. And you can take control of your future and direct your life where you want to go. And once you do that, you're just unstoppable. And I, I talk about in my book, there's 10 simple steps towards true wealth. The first step is taking control is making that decision like you talk about, Linda, and just going forward. And it sounds simple. It sounds kind of trivial, but it's so, so powerful because once you make that decision, once you commit to something in your mind, then you set the power of intention to work and the resources show up, the different tools that you need show up in your life and the opportunities show up and they're all right in front of you right now. You just need to make that decision and create that mindset to be able to see them. And then once you do, you're unstoppable. I totally agree with that. And I've often said wealth begins with the decision mm-hmm. because a lot of people just never decide that they want to be wealthy. Well, everybody says that they want to be rich or that they want to have success, but their actions don't coincide with their words. And when we talk about the decision, when we talk about deciding and and wealth does start there, that you you really commit in your mind. And then as soon as you commit in your mind, so I I always say your mind manifests what it creates. And you you and I could write a book about the mindset piece with our own quotes here, but... um, Your mind manifests what it creates. So whatever it is that you want, create that first in your mind and then believe in it. Conceive, believe, and achieve, as Napoleon Hill says. So amazingly powerful. That's right. I love that. And Zig Ziglar said, you don't just wander around and end up at the top of Mount Everest. Mm. (laughs) (laughs) Love that one, too. Because you really, you know, you have to have that vision that you want to be on Mount Everest. And then, you know, think of the planning that it takes when you are climbing a mountain. And I'm not a mountain climber, but I can imagine all the planning it takes, all the training and the dedication and also the belief that you are going to get there. It's not like they start up the mountain and then don't think that they can really get to the top, right? But Mm -hmm. so many people start a business or they start out in life wanting more and then somehow they lose the belief and faith that they can actually do it and they just give up Mm -hmm. but that mountain climber is always they're always in belief and faith that they're going to get to the top of the mountain right so Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't easily get discouraged, although, you know, many bad things can happen and they can have many pitfalls, but they just keep their focus on their end goal and they just decide that they're not going to let anything stop them. And that's then and, and they get to the top. Right, right. They have that clear vision of what the top looks like, too. And that end forces the means. So you don't have to know everything that you're going to do in between now and $10 million or whatever your goal is. You just have to know what that end goal is and what the first step is there to get there. And then you, once you get to that spot, then you find out the next step. Then you find out the next step. You just kind of continue this process and all of a sudden you look, oh, I'm already halfway up the mountain. How about that? That's great. Well, can you go through your steps with us or do you want to share some of them or can you share? um, I know that we're going to talk about your book in just a second. That'd be a great segue to go right into your book to talk about those 10 steps. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll talk about a few of the uh, important first ones, and they may not sound very important, but trust me, they are, and and I think you can agree with that. So we've already talked about the first one, which is kind of taking control. And when I also talk about taking control, I talk about taking responsibility. So a lot of times some things have happened to us, both in our control and outside of our control, and it's not until you really come to terms with what reality is, those things happen, uh, whether they're, they're good or bad. But the only thing that you control is the future. So the first step is taking control. Make the decision, take control of your future. The second step is developing, developing this mindset that we're talking about. So this is the biggest challenge that I had. This is the biggest challenge that I think 80%, if not 99% of people have is to getting out of our own way. So we're our own greatest enemy. And what you have to do is reprogram your mind. And I had some experts kind of talk about how to do that. And you have to start to think rich. You have to think big. You have to think exactly like the rich do. And uh, Think and Grow Rich is another great book that people need to check out if we haven't talked about it five times already. Um, And the third piece, which kind of goes along with the mindset, is creating the right environment. So your environment creates who you are. You're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So when I talk about the environment, it's the information that goes into your head. So are you listening to great books or are you listening to the news? 
Are you listening to positive information or negative information? Because it really has a huge impact on your mindset, on your beliefs, on your actions, and on your self-confidence, everything. And uh, the information is huge. But along with the environment are also your net or your network and also your team. So every single successful person I've talked to on, on the Yopro Off podcast that I asked, every single one of them has a coach. And that was eye-opening for me. So we think of athletes and we think of different people having coaches. But if you want to be the best in the world at anything, if you want to be your best self, then you need coaches. You need external advisors that are really advising you uh, to where you want to go. And the other one, uh, like I just mentioned, was your network. And your network is your net worth. So those three pieces alone, make the decision, start to develop the mindset, start to get out of your own way and practice those daily habits that uh, are necessary to do that, and then create the right environment. And if you do those three things, then everything else will really start to, to become much easier. You'll start to get down your path towards wealth like I talk about. And then the fourth thing, this is the final one I'll talk about, which is build the financial foundation. So I hate to talk about even getting out of debt or saving or, or doing these uh, some of these more simple things, but they're absolutely, absolutely necessary. And you have to do them just because you have to build the strong foundation. So if you want to build a skyscraper, you have to build a strong foundation. And the mindset, the en environment, that network, uh, these simple habits around what's going on with your money, these things are the strong foundation that are going to get you to, to build just whatever it is that you want. And without it, you'll go broke again. So we see lottery winners who win hundreds of millions of dollars or tens of millions of dollars. Two years later, guess what happens? Most of them end up broke again because they don't have that mindset. They don't have that environment. They don't have those financial habits. They have none of this foundation that we're talking about, and that's why they end up broke again. So do those things, and you're well on your way. I love that. And if you're going to build a skyscraper, you better dig deep too, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so tell us when your book is coming out and how people can get a copy. The book will be out November 11th, so uh, very shortly if you're, if you're listening to this right away. And if it's past November 11th, go to Amazon. Check it out. It's called Make Money, Live Wealthy. Um, you can also go to makemoneylivewealthy.com. Since it's my first book, since I interviewed 75 people and are, are using their information, the first 1,000 copies are free. So you can get a free copy at makemoneylivewealthy.com. But I'm just so excited about it because I think it's motivating and I think it's also very actionable. So I think we say that we lack money, but what we really lack often is direction. And progress is the secret to success and happiness. And all we really need are those first couple steps to get into motion. And once we do that, then you start to build this momentum. Once you build momentum, you're unstoppable. So it's um, hopefully going to be pretty powerful. I'm excited to get it out there. I've had great feedback so far. And uh, it's, it's go time. So check it out. Oh, it sounds awesome. I can't wait to read it. And I will put a link to makemoneylivewealthy.com on the show notes as well awesome. so people can get there. Um, and tell us your website. Yeah, so I have that site and then I also have Yo Pro Wealth. That's Y O. P R O wealth.com. And then I have a personal site, but, uh, it's, it's hard to spell my last name. So just go to yo pro wealth. There you can see the podcast and also the blog. And, uh, we've got a lot going on there as well as some training programs. So, and yo pro is for young professionals is what yo pro stands for, right? Exactly. Exactly. But it's funny. So I, I thought I was talking to 20 year olds, but what I found is anybody that's ready to take control of their finances the messages of the people that I've been interviewing have resonated with. So anybody that's ready to take their finances to the next level uh, are listening. So actually a large amount of my audience are in their 40s, surprisingly. So it's uh, young professionals at heart and young professionals by age. So anybody. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so much, Austin. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you. You have a lot of wisdom, and I'm just so glad that you were here to share it with everyone. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, everybody. Until next time, live the good life and be wealthy and smart. Thank you for listening to Be Wealthy and Smart with Linda P. Jones. Share the wealth and tell your family and friends about the show. Check out our website, blog, and social media for more riches at www.bewealthyandsmart.com.